Hey, what is up? It is the Man Fuse Podcast. Kay Lee, audio producer, your host, my co-host, Ben H., real estate broker in the house. And live. Yes. And on video. Looking and good. And on video. Looking good as always. Like a million bucks now, in cash. Now, on the Man Fuse Podcast in the past, we have touched on ancient aliens, civilizations, medieval torture methods, and things like that. We've had a flat earther on. We've, you know, we like to touch on it all we bound into all different types of theories now what happened was ben h went down this rabbit hole of looking at these architectural structures that just kind of dumbfounded him in a way i love architecture and so i pulled some strings and we have a special guest his name is matthew Lacroix. he is a passionate writer researcher he grew up exploring the outdoors of northern new england he began studying ancient civilizations philosophy, quantum mechanics, and history a lot smarter than me. He has been researching secret societies, ancient cultures that disappeared long ago. He just was featured on The Unexplained on the History Channel with William Shatner. He's been on the uh, Mystery School of Truth on Forbidden Knowledge TV. And he has worked with some notable researchers and authors. And he is an author himself. And I will post all of his info on the episode description. And we're going to get him on right now. Beast mode. Matthew. Yes. How are you, buddy? What's up, Matthew? Good. So my co-host, Ben H., that was him. What's up, man? We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk with us, man. Well, hey, gentlemen, it's great to be here talking to you both. I just met you both only a couple days ago, but I would love to sit down and have a chat about some of these ancient mysteries of our world. Because Ben has questions. Yeah, I mean, this is really (laughs) exciting to me because I'm one of these people who just absolutely is engaged and I'm very curious about all the things and in reading your bio and the information that you sent to us i know of and and i'm a big fan of yours and and billy carson and you know randall carlson and just many of the people that you work with so it's an honor to have you here and we look forward to it well thank you i i appreciate that and feel free to ask questions that you're curious about i'll do the best i can to give at least my opinion based on the evidence or whatever kind of hypothesis i've come up with i love it so why don't we start with exactly you know the topics that i started to send you you and they were because ben has been on a dive of these yeah. you know north american architecture these buildings that you know and you might rebut some of the hole that he's been going down or you might be able to shed light on what you have found about the structures in north america which i guess in our text back and forth well you seem to be like let me preface it too because my research matthew has been really intrigued by this guy named john levi have you heard of him i have so John, I don't know, he does a lot of research. He does a lot of driving around. He does a lot of exploration of the camera on Google Earth and things. And and somehow he came onto my radar and the content that he produces is just fantastic. So anyways, I've been kind of watching a lot of his stuff and I find it fascinating the things that he finds out specifically in the Western region of the United States where he lives because he drives around all of this architecture, you know, even, even old Greco-Roman style architecture in Alabama, out in the middle of the desert somewhere, old brickwork kind of seeming to be melded together with a mountain, you know, just ancient, ancient things here in the United States, uh, pyramids and Egyptian artifacts and the Grand Canyon. And just, you know, we have a narrative that we've been taught about the United States, and it seems that there's much more to it than that. And honestly, For me, I'm just scratching the surface and, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts on 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 all that information. Okay. Sometimes it's difficult in terms of, I guess, um, kind of like if you were to tell a kid there's no Santa Claus, if they're really getting into it, it's sometimes. There's um, no Santa? And, and I'm, not, I'm not using that as, as an example for this, but one of the hardest things is trying to determine, well, what is real, what is not? And of course, some people might say, well, that's your opinion. Right. But one of the challenges is being able to look at both ancient history, the geological processes that have altered and changed our Earth over time, understanding climatic processes 
processes, time changes over periods of Earth history and how they related to different places in the world. And then the, the challenge goes in, okay, well then how does Earth history relation to the, the rise of civilizations fall into any of this? When did civilizations first emerge? Is it what we're taught in school right. as being only 6,000 years old out of the Fertile Crescent? Or is there a much, much older story? Now, this is where I would caution those who are listening to this a little bit. One, I would be very open-minded to look at everything and just try to absorb and understand that you're looking at an entire alternative version of history and viewpoints of things that is definitely very difficult to navigate. Yeah. That's the, I guess that's the first place I want to point out. We see emerging evidence from around the world of an entire chapter or chapters of human history that were destroyed by utterly massive catastrophes on earth beyond our comprehension in our modern lifetimes that seem to have wiped out chapters that left behind these incredible structures around the world that we have no idea how they were built yeah now i'm leading into what you are asking here in terms of this because this is very much a, a lead in type of answer based on that ancient architectural knowledge that was once had around the world there were secret societies and groups Groups later on that knew some of what they knew mm -hmm. and they built some very very incredible churches yes. with some very very beautiful stonework and other things around the world because they knew what's called sacred geometry and this divine stone masonry that had to do with specific ratios and numbers and angles yes. and things that related to the ancient world and to them everything was proportionally geometrically perfect so like what we build today is nothing like the mentality of what they had back then that's right and that's why it just seems very, very different because for them, they were creating something that was based on these proportions of sacred geometry and energetic factors. Yes. It was like this whole other comprehension of their world that we don't know. Now, those people that built those later structures, they knew some of what those ancients did. That's essentially why they were able to still create some pretty incredible cathedrals and places that we just don't seem to care or want to build ever again. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, that makes complete sense. I've been really captivated by the architecture and the technology of many of these cathedrals that that we have here in the United States and there's they're in Europe and they're all over the world and they look very similar as if designed by the same architect or yeah or yeah. you know one of the things that I'm curious about is you know when we see the windows on the cathedrals you know the beautiful round windows and they typically have stained glass and I'm talking about these old ancient cathedrals that are you know a thousand or however many years old when we see how sound waves affect water we get patterns that look like the stained glass windows on these cathedrals. And I guess there's theories about the idea that the bell, which was at one time in the cathedral, actually resonated that sound frequency and it was used for healing or something to that effect. Yes. And then there were organs inside of the cathedrals, which the fact that they're called organs, the frequencies actually would heal your organs if played in certain sequences and things That's of that right. nature. Is that what you understand as well? I mean, am I going to down uh, a rabbit hole here? Or is... No, no, you're very right. Our understanding of what the ancients knew, and I'll say that the ancient ancient, I mean, I'm talking about the civilizations that existed not before 6,000 years ago, but before 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. We know of comprehensive evidence that there were civilizations around the world that had originally perfected that concept that you're talking about. Yeah, And we know that because we find the structures that have been harmonically tuned right. in precisely the way to what's called 432 hertz. Mm. It's basically there's a harmonic resonance that has to do with consciousness of humans. And there's places around the world, and one of them, just as an example, only one of them, is, say, like the Hippogeum of Malta. It's what's called the Oracle Chamber. It was literally designed to function as a sound, higher frequency conscious chamber to both use sound for healing as was reaching higher states. And that seems to be the specific purpose of the king's chamber mm. in the Great Pyramid of Giza as well. Wow. These had nothing to do with being for places for sarcophagi or any of these places. They seem to be in tune with this understanding of something that has not related to the physical world. It's this non-physical world of frequency, vibration, and sound and how that seems to dictate and determine everything around us. Wow. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, which is so interesting because these seem to be lost conversations in society and, and, and in the narrative that we're taught, even from a religious
religious perspective, these conversations yeah. aren't happening. No, because after those chapels and cathedrals were built, there was a bit of a corruption of what you could call religion, spirituality, and even rewriting of history after, say, like the Holy Roman Empire was created. It's an unfortunate long narrative and story that's complex, but relates around this idea of literally changing the harmonic balance in all music notes and basically our entire world away from 432 hertz to 430 in which offsets and unbalances basically everything and some people will go down that road of saying that it's a conspiracy to basically take this harmonious balance that once existed and and take it so it's not tuned to everything and like how that could affect just the balance of human beings basically if everything is tuned away from our natural frequency you know what could that do to us so it's an interesting concept and idea that there was a knowledge and understanding of how these things affect us back long ago and that it even potentially could be used against us with some ways where we exist now and maybe that explains why so many people just seem to be what you know that term is like largely kind of asleep walking around and not really yeah. realizing this illusionary world they really largely exist in yeah i mean a hundred percent man and you just brought up some things that really stimulated a few things in my mind because i think often to myself as i'm viewing the architecture of these structures specifically the churches and the things that we see throughout the world which are called greco-roman architecture ultimately right i mean that's yeah, what we yeah. see we see but we see it in areas which are not populated anymore we see it destroyed in areas where where there is no history around that type of an occupation or anything like that but i look at the yeah. structures and then me personally i think these structures are heavenly this is so beautiful i just i'm so inspired and then we see the destruction of these structures and the destruction of not just the religious structures but the architecture architecture itself was heavenly. I mean, these castles and these beautiful homes and, and even buildings and cities. And, and I wonder to myself, did the rapture already occur? The rapture that's written in, about in the Bible, did it already happen? You know, if what's written is true, did something like that already occur? And is the change in frequency, is that now Satan's reign? Is Satan's reign, if that's where we are right now, is it defined by the shift in frequency, as you say, from 430? 32 hertz to whatever the hell it is right now 430 is that what you said yeah so that's an interesting place you get down the road of sort of mixing religious text and prophecy with you could even then cross over with what the ancients believed and i think if we were to go look at like what the maya and the aztec and a lot of even like the kali yuga cycles out of india which is another ancient ancient civilization there that's older than we're told which by the way if you want to see probably the finest architecture in the world yeah. if you want to go look there's no comparison anywhere in the world compared to india Go look at Alora Caves okay. in India, Bara Bara Caves. Look at some of the architecture and how they've like especially Alora Caves, the design of how they created an entire basalt mountain. In fact, it's the only place in the world that we know of. They took an entire basalt mountain, which is a very, very hard type of volcanic rock, yeah. and cut the entire mountain into one single temple That's that is the most intricately carved temple I know of anywhere in the world. Wow. It's called Kalesa Temple in Alora Caves, India. If you want to see something that mind blowing, we have no idea how they created it. We have no idea how they even begun to create that kind type of structure. That's cool. Um, wow. But really, getting back to what you said, these cultures talked a lot about how they understood that there were these cycles that existed. Yeah. It's, it's always cycles within cycles, cycles within spirituality, religion of certain times when people go towards, you know, you could say God or source of, or creation from or away from it, right. or depending on or times of being lost with the illusions of money, materialism, conditioning and war and all these things versus times of focusing on, say, like the earth and harmony and reaching higher consciousness. These are cycles that seem to go back and forth throughout Earth history. It's not simply based on our time now. Right. And based on that, one of the most interesting concepts that seems to be I have to always remind people and it seems to echo always over and over again is when you're getting a great change of an age, they're moving towards vibrationally this great change where I guess the old ways just don't work anymore. People like the puppet master sort of gets revealed and all of a sudden people start to see through a veil. That's happening. People are starting to see things in a way they've never saw them before. Yes. People are opening up in concepts and ideas that they've never done before. And so what does that mean? Well, just as people are doing that and we could say waking up, even though that's become kind of a polluted term, people are changing all around the world. There's still all this opposition to things at the same time that are happening. You could call them dark 
things, this mm. corruption in certain aspects, this other side that seems to be equally fighting at the same time is hard. Yes. And I think that's really what we need to wrap our heads around like a really high level view. Get out of yourself for a second and just imagine in a higher level view where we are going towards this time of higher consciousness and awareness of things that we haven't in a long, potentially thousands of years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm. Now imagine that's happening and there is a type of opposition that does exist that is trying to almost stop that or be the opposite. That's what that prophecy you're seeing is. It is like this idea that there will be a manifestation of evil and darkness at the very time of transition towards something we have never seen before. That's fascinating, man. And it makes sense. I mean, I see it, right? I mean, I really feel that I do see it, like the way you just described it. I feel that way. And I feel in my own self an awakening occurring, whereas I am interested in these changes and these shifts. And I feel the energy. I was, but, but you probably feel differently than you did 20 years ago, right? Much different. And as you said, war, materialism, these types of things. That was my life for, you know, I would say I began my my journey of really awakening about five years ago. But okay. when I was 20, I went to the army. I was in yep. combat for two years. You know, if you know me and a lot of people that listen to the podcast do know me, I've always been obsessed with material things, cars, watches, houses, yep. everything. That's and I've manifested all of those here. things yeah. in a way that has been unbelievable in just the last 10 years. But about five years ago, I just lost patience with the depth of the weight of depression and anxiety and things that I was dealing yeah. with. And I turned to plant medicine and I turned yep. to ceremonial people in the jungle in Costa Rica. And, yep. and I Ayahuasca, spent, DMT. Yep. Yes. Both n many times. Yes. And, 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 that's, and, what, and that's what that'll do it. And that when we talk about frequency and people ask me about my experiences with plant medicine, the way I describe it is that all I can tell you is that it increases the vibrational frequency of your body on a cellular level and allows you to have consciousness in different realms yes. of our dimension or different dimensions and, of consciousness. I, I don't know really and, how to and, explain and it. Even, and there's even more to it, and that would be a great little piece to talk about because you're absolutely right. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Those, that's music to his ears. <laughs> because I've been fighting an uphill battle for the last five years, but you know how it is. Like, I'm the kind of person I'm very vocal. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I lead with emotion. I'm a very emotion-driven person. And man, when I find something great, I just want to tell everybody about it. And I've found that to be a bit more of a challenge when we're talking about these things, specifically vibrational frequency, whether induced by, you know, plant medicine or whether, you know, we're looking at ancient architecture or whatever it might be, it seems to be frequency. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the plant medicine and, and those frequencies and the frequency. And, and dimensions and spirituality and so yeah on. you just opened up a whole can of worms there and I, this is <laughs> unfortunately I, this is a very tricky area to navigate because you don't want to go too deep too fast to unfortunately lose people who aren't ready that's true our understanding of reality and our grasp on reality is very important when we have to reformulate reality and try to understand it in a different way it's very uncomfortable a lot of people would rather run away from the idea of even knowing that there are these uncomfortable truths and aspects that they just simply don't don't want to incorporate because it's it's scary. Yes. It's really difficult. We need to understand that there is a gigantic system here. I don't care if, if you don't believe it, that's your opinion. If you don't believe it, I've studied this for well over 10 years. Every aspect of it, I've written books about it. My first book was called The Illusion of Us. I focused entirely on the idea that there is a giant system that's been created here to prevent what you went through. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of it. That's why all plant medicines are the highest restricted in terms of legal Legally, right. Those are being prevented so that it's a quiet prevention of society essentially like waking up. Yes. And the reason for that is that the system has been created long ago. And what it is, is just a group of very clever individuals, not the ones who built those beautiful things. Some of those individuals that came just after, they realized like we can't have like a super conscious aware, aware society or at that time when it was more of an industrial era and more of a time when people were getting things done to propel economies 
and different things. Right. It was very much decided to create a certain curriculum. It really, it's just a social conditioning of creating how we perceive things. Yes. Right. Everything is based on how we perceive things. Your parents teach you a version of reality that's based on what their parents taught them, but it's also based on a combination of their education system, their friends and media and everything that bombards them. What if that entire reality was wrong? What if that entire reality strips us of the gifts and the creativity that we have and prevents us from seeing the truth of reality, understanding who we really are and where we come from and, and, and our past, everything. That's is That's what the whole idea of the matrix is, is if you create a system of rules, regulations and conditioning, you can create a world where people are trapped in like a reality show existence Whereas they don't realize they're on a spinning planet that's going 24,000 miles an hour that's in a vast universe of trillions of planets and galaxies. And here we are kind of forgetting all of that. Right. And just, and we're existing in this place where people are like worried about like what sale goes on at the mall or something. It's almost like insane. So you just yes. said something. And that, I believe that to be true, by the yeah, way. Yeah, and I'm trying too. to escape it. Yeah, yeah. I want that. I, I see the writing on the wall. So I do mean, I. I. I really do. And I believe it to be true. But it's very difficult to escape. It's that's, very that's difficult was, to get outside go. of it. It really is you, difficult. You have to let it, go of everything. Because it's been so successful and because the majority of people are that type of normal person that doesn't think about this. And I mean, that's changing now. You're getting more and more people all the time. You're like totally surprised about, right? I want to be careful on that statement. But traditionally, that's why it seems so out of the norm and why it's so effective. If you go through that experience you had, right? You go through that profound DMP experience and your neurological structure essentially rearranges itself. Yes. That's what happens. You go through a neurological rearranging of your neurological structure to all of a sudden see reality in a way that it never did. And honestly, it might never have been able to. Wow. True. Very true. So think about it this way. Imagine a computer is this metaphor that represents you. You have a computer that's, say, 30 years old or 35 years old. You're the same computer. You're full of viruses and all of these adware and all this crap on it, right? Yeah. The only way to actually clean that computer and to have it function differently is to wipe it. Yeah. Yep. To wipe the whole thing and reset it. That's what you did. Yeah. Good That's what you did. You reset the computer to then start over again, but with a foundation of seeing things not from like a potentially corrupted, conditioned mindset, but more or less now your eyes have been opened to a reality that's been called by the ancients, like the Gnostics, a great veil of illusion. Yeah, man. Wow. So true. And honestly, so so much a part of my experience, since that's what we're ultimately talking about, was visually and experientially in ancient format. That's because, okay, so when you're in those DMT experiences, when you're seeing those flower of life and those sacred geometry symbols, yes. the purpose behind that is that it's showing you the blueprint for basic reality. Oh. That's what reality is. If you look at T Nikola Tesla, all reality comes down to is basically frequency vibration and basically sound. That's it. And so if that's what reality is, then that means that the physical reality of what we see around us is an illusion because everything else is the basis for where that comes from. So it means that if you forget that what you are seeing in front of you is actually not real, you'll get lost in it. And the reason I say that is imagine you're a being that's far greater than you could ever imagine that you've been taught. Imagine you're something like very powerful and incredible and right. you incarnate here and you're in this body and you're in this experience, but you don't remember anything about what you really are and then you get conditioned into believing that you're like this simplistic ape that is nothing and that you should just be a survival of the fittest and fight each other or alternatively to not leave this other group out that I don't want to forget you're told a superior religious group that's better than another religious group and you should go kill and conquer them Right. regardless of those two mindsets those two mindsets have blocked you from understanding who you really are that's right. and I just want to add this because I need we need to lead this back the ancients understood all of this they right. wrote all about it in every ancient text. They designed every structure around harmonious balance. They understood they built literally structures. The Great Pyramid of Giza, the three Great Pyramids, as well as Teotihuacan, on the other side of the world in Mexico, the three pyramids there are built to exactly mimic the three belt stars of Orion. They were so precise and advanced that they not only knew they understand the harmonic vibrational frequency importance on Earth here, but they would literally take the heavens, the power of stars and their energy, and because they would design the these structures to mimic them, they would create this synergy between heaven on earth. Mm. They understood things that we have no comprehension today of at all. It's so beautiful, man. It's that's crazy. It's wild.
so wild. I so love it. Yeah. It's become my passion. It's it's life. What he's talking about is life. You know, these people understood what life was. And we don't. It, we we yeah, take it and, for granted. We just throw it away. We have this beautiful gift from God. And we are just. Well, we're distracted. Yeah. Every, well, that's exactly. what I'm saying. At every second <laughs> of the day. Distracted. Exactly. And that's the system. That, that's, now, imagine yeah, if what our real, our real gifts yeah. are. Imagine if what our real gifts are. This is what they told us. Is that we're actually like powerful creators okay that's why you can essentially think of an idea and go create it and it literally comes from nothing right you can create anything we can create a potentially technology in the future to like harness like a wormhole yeah. like some of the most powerful forces of the universe we have the potential to do that we're creators of the universe and that's the whole point is that the trick is to strip us of anything that we are to then use us as almost like a slavery system to then create an economic output to be like a cog in like a machine. It's what it is. It is that system. It is a slavery system. I mean, it's the matrix. A very sophisticated. It's the, whole, it's the whole story of the matrix. Like, yes, I mean, that's what the whole exactly, point of that movie is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's brilliant the way that they you know detailed it because it it is so true and I see it every day. Yeah, but you you ready for this to blow your mind? Remember yes. that scene in the Matrix where I'm telling you that movie is brilliant. The Wachowski sister brothers knew all about <laughs> what we're talking about. Yeah, they did. Remember the scene in how this is going to blow your mind. The scene in how Neo meets with the architect. Yes. My favorite single thing in the entire Matrix series is this concept of an architect that designs reality for you. Right. Okay. The designer. That designer, we see blueprints of that throughout history. Okay. Now I love in that part where Neo meets with the architect and he says that there have been like several versions before that didn't work. Remember that? Yes. yes. And then, then this is the version that seems to suit. That's exactly what happened. That's so exactly what happened is that we literally existed in a different version of reality than we do now in the ancient past. And the only reason those ancients aren't around anymore is they were destroyed all over the earth by catastrophes that are like on a Hollywood level. And that's the only reason why we lost all of that. But after they were destroyed, there are tablets to talk about how this concept of laws and rules known as kingship had to be re-lowered again and civilization had to be recreated again. That's the kind of dynamic they're talking about. And they actually talk about how now the period we're in was this clever, very, very clever collaboration of rules and laws that were created that we can trace to the Holy Roman Empire with Constantine and these meetings around how they were literally designing um, how our history would be read and about how we would want to perceive things things based on laws, rules, conditioning, work, those things were actually more decided than we realize. It's no accident that we ended up where we are now. And it really isn't. And that's what I want people to wrap their heads around is to stop thinking that everything are just coincidences and random is there's far less of that than we really think if you actually look at it. I don't believe in coincidences, really. Ben, I just really quickly, I love people being open-minded and looking for ancient stuff around the world, yeah. looking for patterns. I love that. Yeah. We must be very careful, though, that just because something looks like something else doesn't mean it is. Right. What I want to point out is we have to understand Earth history and look at places like what was the United States and Canada like during this time period of these ancient civilizations? Could they have ever existed? Right. And we look at something like, well, there was ice caps one to two miles deep in Canada that broke into North America. And I got a lot of people who ask questions about these would appear to be megaliths in Montana. Yeah. But the problem is that was under miles of ice during the time period we know we have radiocarbon dating and we know that these civilizations that had that level we're looking for around the world of sophistication we know when they existed right we know that they didn't exist past 12,000 years ago because we can see when these catastrophes occurred and so we have like a basic timeline for when these things occurred so i unfortunately have to go to people that then get sad when they things like devil's tower in wyoming or these megaliths in montana they think are megaliths and some of these other eroded structures in the southwest and unfortunately I have to say based on anything i've studied with a lack of civilizations that have any evidence of being there and with how tumultuous those places were, those are just structures that look like ancient structures. They're not actually ancient structures, but there are plenty of amazing ancient structures in all around other parts of the world that we don't need to feel sad that those necessarily maybe aren't. No, I'm with you 100%, man. It's really interesting too. I mean, you say Devil's Tower. That is an interesting site. You it's know. like basically a giant basalt dike. Basically think of it like the core of a volcano that had less tough material around it that eroded and left the basically the center core that's what that is that's wild man that is wild 
to lead in so we can understand how this whole thing connects, I want to give you an example. We got to connect this around the world. When I talk about this to people, like the level of sophistication we're talking about, go from a place like Easter Island, okay, all the way to Baalbek, Lebanon, Great Pyramids of Giza area with down through Aswan, Egypt and the unfinished obelisk, all the way to China with the Yangshan Quarry. I want to just mention the point of bringing up all of those sites. Number one, those places are in different parts of the world, right? Yeah. All different parts of the world. Number two, those sites show us that those places had the oldest civilizations in the world that we know of sophisticated civilizations, not primitive, not hunter-gatherers. We know that those locations had these incredibly sophisticated megaliths, okay? But what we also know is that of those locations I just mentioned, each one of them displays a characteristics that's uncanny and almost worrisome. They all have, at the largest projects they'd ever taken on, I'll mention them again just in case people don't know, Easter Island, Baalbek, Lebanon, Aswan, Egypt, and the Yangshan Quarry in China. They all had those super civilizations, we'll call them, master civilizations long ago were in the process of taking on the largest projects they'd ever taken on in their history. Stuff that's like colossal. In terms of Baalbek, Lebanon, blocks that are 1,200 tons. That's insane. In Xiangshan Sh- in Sh- in Quarry in China, how about 16,000 tons? Blocks, blocks so big, blocks of stone so big that we could not move them today with our modern machinery. That's nuts. Now, in each one of these locations that I just mentioned, those civilizations were in the process of creating the largest structures that ever made and all of a sudden poof they disappeared wow each one of the largest blocks was left in its quarry unfinished wow. sticking out or like an example in easter island the moai statue they were about to erect was about almost three times bigger than any of the moai statues on the island wow so all of a sudden they disappear in the state where they're all unfinished it tells us that these structures these civilizations were wiped out extremely quickly probably without much of a warning since they were in the middle of work on them and it was so so significant that even though they were harmonically tuned to the balance of the earth and the universe not materialistic building things in incredible precision and understanding cycles they were all wiped out and crazy. we're talking about events that reset humanity essentially and whatever knowledge was passed down was carried down less and less to the point where we had to almost start over again okay that's wow. why so many incredibly sophisticated things were built long ago and then we were never able to do it again for instance like the great pyramid of giza two and a half million stone blocks an average of eight to ten tons each it's physically impossible would have taken them laying over 100 blocks a day for like 50 years it's, it's impossible right it's impossible we know that it's part of technology that we simply cannot replicate yeah we we don't understand it we don't have now it. that now that i've laid that down the point of that is researchers in my field have been in two camps studying what could have caused that right and the two camps are like you're familiar with Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson that's the camps of a cosmic impact yes and while I support the idea of that I'm in the camp of a coronal mass ejections has made a lot more sense to me based on the evidence around the world can you now, repeat that that last thing again yeah so based on the evidence around the world i believe that these catastrophes and these civilizations were actually destroyed not by a cosmic impact necessarily primarily i'll say but from these massive solar events these coronal mass ejections gotcha and the reason i say that is we find these really bizarre things around the world where these ancient sites that we know are a certain age have these like strips of black across them in yeah. some places where they were burned and the it's mountains called vitrif- as well. vitrification yeah yeah and to, and to take that it means that some temperatures on the earth would have had to exceed 2000 degrees wow i mean we can't even comprehend the, the hottest temperature on record on earth is like 130 2, something thousand degrees that is like scorched earth that's, that's why what it is. Scorched earth. that's why we're seeing in places like turkey you see the largest underground cities in the world they were created to house over twenty thousand people because these right? ancient people would go into great lengths because they knew that unless they went underground during these events they would be destroyed and in that case of that civilization, the civilizations are around the Anatolia region of Turkey. They were like, we have celestial libraries like Gobekli Tepe, where they were mapping these giant T-shaped pillars. They were mapping the heavens. They deliberately buried that site knowing a catastrophe was coming. And it took more time to bury it than it did to create it. And they never came back to unbury it. Means that, imagine like the 
the ancient people went into these caves to survive these events and then they never made it out. That's that's just so intense. Or they the reason couldn't I'm leaning, come out in their lifetime, right? I right mean, well, you, well, yeah, because i got to tell you, when you're studying ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica, some of these periods of catastrophes and upheavals between ice ages and non-ice ages, meaning interglacial periods, these periods of time between not constant disasters but imagine right. a disaster in the front end and then maybe in the middle and then one at the end yeah. but how about ups and downs that are extreme for like 1500 years yeah exactly it's like a hundred year a human life cycle is like nothing right? compared to the cycle of these events right i mean it's not like it was over in a couple weeks no that's you the know? point is that we we have to it's <laughs> like imagine even these people being this sophisticated and this good at surviving back in the day like not now where we just go to a grocery store and just buy our food but imagine like those hard people still not making it okay so then with that being said it almost appears as if now these are natural events or is there an architect that's the part that gets complicated because because you want to go like high level go into ancient sumerian and babylonian tablets which is one of the expert the things i focus on as an expert is reading ancient sumerian and looking into the history of the oldest civilizations on earth that left behind the most extensive records and they did it in the most ingenious way possible by doing wedges into clay and then baking them mm -hmm. which was the only way you can have any message preserved for more than 500 years. Interesting. Wow. A paper at the most extensive in a dry ancient Tibetan library, which we found in 1901 in Tibet, the oldest records we can get for paper resources is 500 to 1,000 years. Wow. In the best conditions possible. Best possible conditions, meaning that the only way you can have a message appear is survive anywhere on Earth, besides orally, which, of course, gets corrupted over time, <laughs> is through the, the brilliance of these ancient Sumerians and Akkadians and Babylonians was etching into clay and then firing it, and then it could survive five five ten thousand years wow. wow so they intense. anyway they so they left behind thousands and thousands of tablets about just literally telling us like look this didn't happen by accident civilization was handed down here and created that's what they talk about in every tablet and they talk about how there was these powerful angelic like beings that are basically like us but more powerful that created us they created everything here like they created civilization is all knowledge of mathematics astronomy animal husbandry agriculture they state that it was handed down from them. And it's very extensively talked about and shown. Like, for instance, there's a, a cylinder seal called the Mula Pin that shows about this connection with the star constellations and how they were designing cities to be based on those constellations like Eridu. And the first cities ever created were created in Mesopotamia to mimic the constellation of Eridanus. That's why the first city ever created was called Eridu. Okay. Based on the constellation of Eridanus. Got it. Okay. Then they then go on to state that they then handed down all knowledge of how to create civilization to these cities that emerge and that that's where they came from. But then they go on to talk about how humanity and this experiment here became out of control and they created catastrophes to wipe us out here. The higher beings from the Eridanus. They're not from there specifically. They don't tell us where they're from. Essentially, we are them. They made and, us and, and, in their image. Okay, so biblically, because I know you guys from the Bible Belt down there, That's right. imagine imagine they are exactly the same thing as archangels. That's what they are. Right. They are them. And right. that God is real and source is real, but there are other things mixed in that are related and connected to it that are complex. Right. Huh. The ancients described God as being this perfect creation of everything. Everything yeah. is created in perfection. But in order for it to be a perfect creation, you can't influence in a way where you impose yourself. Wow. So imagine if you were to have to stand back and everything unfolds. But there are extensions of you that exist. Right. That's what they essentially describe the creators of us as being like extensions of God. That which is why we're so angelic and connected, so closely connected to God in so many religious texts throughout history. Gotcha. So fascinating, man. At one point, they were decided to wipe us out, and it we survived. Some of these catastrophes catastrophes are part of a, a cycle which is like almost like a game where it's like how far can we get in 13,000 years before we have to start over again wow yeah i mean essentially right because there's another wipeout coming at it, some point but, well that's the greatest thing about this amazing movie of humanity this great story this epic of humanity that we're going through these trials and tribulations of us almost being wiped out you know potential for the gifts that we have being held back so much for so long and then this surprising twist where we're supposed to be wiped out and we actually make it or how about the twist of how we are the most corrupted um living the most 
illusion world reality we ever had in all of our history. And we had ancient people that understood their harmonious balance with the universe and consciousness, and they were destroyed, and we may be the ones that survived. What a twist that is. Yeah. 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 That, that's a plot twist. Plot yeah. twist. <laughs> and yeah, the that... idea is that it's like, well, we also have certain technologies they didn't have. Yes. That whole other conversation, I don't know if we have time for it, but it's basically getting into what I believe is the cause of why all those catastrophes have been happening. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically, in a nutshell, quick summary. You know, NASA's trying to figure out the solar system in the 1960s. We have the whole moon experience. We start to try to figure out our solar system. We don't really know a lot. The Babylonian civilizations and Sumerians, if anything, knew more about the solar system than we did. Um, Do. Well, now we do. But <laughs> anyway... What year did he say? In the 60s. Like... I was going to say, because 1958 was a really interesting year. Yeah, so the 50s, 60s, they're kind of like trying to figure things out. And then in the 19, yeah. 1971 and 72, 73, this is when they actually put it in action. They create the first technology of a probe that can actually leave our inner solar system. And they're called the Pioneer Probes, Pioneer 10 and 11. I'll constantly mention when I talk about this is that most people who know anything about this or anything to do with probes in space have usually only heard of Voyager. Right. Well, because the Voyager came after. Right. But the Pioneer Probes were the first craft to pass in interstellar space in 1983, and yet nobody talks about them. So wow. anyway. Yeah, I didn't even know about that. I know. So this is where this gets into literally like a rabbit hole. Another one. Another one. <laughs> another one. <laughs> another like rabbit DJ hole. Yeah, another, another one. one. <laughs> so remember, remember this whole thing? of catastrophes well turns out you know i've studied antarctic ice cores we can go back in antarctica we can take vostok ice core samples 450,000 years ago and see trends of cycles here Interesting. what you see is that there seems to be a, an ice age glaciation that seems to happen about a, every 100,000 years consistently there's cycles that are going on here that are triggering these consistent things now consistently when those ice ages end they end in catastrophe every time every time and, and when we're those obviously ice ages, on the ass end of an ice age and when interglacial meaning non-ice ages move into ice ages they also have catastrophes mm. so what it means is that look humans are maybe perpetuating a natural cycle but we are doing nothing like what we're being told if you look at climatic history of earth the temperature fluctuations and swings that we're looking at now are like almost not even a blip compared to what happened in the past not even a blip so it's changing climate change i'm so we're seeing evidence from siberia in the 19 one, Edward Toll found evidence of massive graveyards of mastodons and mammoths and other species that seem to have flash frozen while in the middle of eating uh, huh. and basically were frozen into an ice cube. Dang. And it was determined in order to do that, you would have had to have temperatures that drop to 150 degrees below zero instantly. Just immediately. The yeah. coldest temperature on record on Earth in, in our modern human history is negative 128. Dang. Wow. Okay, so I know we're getting sensational here, but the point is the history of Earth and our climate is chaotic, if anything. Don't think of it as being consistent. Right. Now, imagine they send these probes out and they don't really know what they're looking for, but they know that our entire solar system is slightly tilted on its axis from something gravitationally influencing it. Okay. They know that because they look at Uranus and Neptune and they're kind of tilted weird. Okay. Astronomers don't need to see something to know it's there. If something's affecting something else, that's all they need to know. They just see the influence of it right right it's more theoretical or, or mathematical yeah well the point is that space isn't illuminated if you don't have a star so if you don't have any illumination occurring everything's going to be dark you're only going to see the influences of what that object is doing based on its mass and gravity interesting okay Absolutely. yeah so, i get it it makes sense now imagine our solar system is two parts not like you've been taught imagine there's an inner solar system and an outer solar system okay that inner solar system is representative of everything beyond the sun uranus neptune all the way out to what's called the kuiper belt and and that Pluto, unfortunately, that got demoted, was originally a moon that was thrown out into orbit by something. Got it. By some, by something. Okay. Now, at the edge of the solar system is what's called the Kuiper Belt. It's a massive asteroid field. And beyond that is what's called the outer solar system. Then when you eventually go beyond that, which is huge, you get out into space. Okay. Right. But our star system, our star has a much larger amount of space for our constellation, our star here, with its planetary systems than we know it is. And what I mean by that is when NASA sent out the Pioneer probes to, to investigate, when they reached interstellar space in 1983, they found a planet that was like peculiar out there. In the middle of nowhere, beyond the Kuiper Belt, they find this planet that's four to five times the size of Earth they state. And it's just really weird because it's, of course, rogue planets are very rare, but most planets are revolving around some kind of a star. Yeah. 
Okay. So this planet's just kind of doing its thing out there, and it's really it's kind of odd, and it's it's acting strange. All the objects in the Kuiper Belt are acting strange, and they in- initially reported this that another planet existed out there. Well, this is where it gets into a huge conspiracy because two astronomers start investigating this to figure out what its planetary companion is. Robert named Robert Harrington, who is the head of the U.S. Navy Astronomy Department. That's like a high level guy. Right. And then you have a guy named Thomas Van Flandern, who is a, a U.S. astronomer who's well known. He calls up Robert Harrington's like, look, Pioneer Data found this planet. NASA's kind of looking into it. They're affiliated with NASA, but they're not NASA. They're affiliated. And so they start looking at it themselves. Well, at the same time, that Pioneer Probe is traveling further and further out into space. And it finds something mm. that completely changes our perspective. Well, at the time, NASA's perspective forever. And what they found is that they found something so so bizarre that it, it's what caused hiding of data and controlling the narrative and all the stuff that happened later. They found that this planet was revolving around a incredibly distant binary companion to our star, our sun. Okay, now before I lose everybody on the call, <laughs> go on my website and I'll show you proof that will blow your mind. On my website, beststageoftime.com, scroll about halfway down the, the main page. You're going to see an image from what's called the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia. Okay, from what I've done, I've determined studying this we and I'm writing it. a new book on it right now, is that this is the only place that any of the data from the Pioneer 10 and 11 survived anywhere. It seems that when this binary star companion was discovered, they must have ran physics, you know, rotational tests to see its uh, aphelion and perihelion around our sun. And they determined that, look, these catastrophes, these ice ages and these cycles that are extreme, that have destroyed civilizations throughout history are primarily, I'm not going to say the only source, but primarily based on the influences of this object. And what, what is the object? They found that based on the telemetry and the technology that is on this probe, they found that the signature of this object was it's got a massive gravitational pull, first of all, potentially stronger than our sun, potentially, but it doesn't have any illumination. They determined that it's a dead star, meaning that when a star dies, it goes through two processes. One that people are familiar with, it's a supermassive star. It'll go through a supernova and it'll often turn into a black hole. Yeah. But that's for a super, supermassive star. We don't have anything like that anywhere near us right that's like century and beetlejuice and those guys right yeah if it's not massive it'll explode into a mini nova smaller but then it'll turn into like this dense dark black object that that is still a star but has no illumination Mm. it's just got like a massive radiation core with a, a lot of gravitational influence still so you mean like as it moves it would be moving planets in our solar system imagine a gigantic dance going on between our suns our stars mm. our sun has a dance that doesn't bring it very close or we'd all be dead but there's a dance where its distances allow a large rotational dance that has influences on everything in the solar system but also comes into play with three other potential things. One, if the planets also align at the same time. Two, what kind of cycles is our sun already going through? And three, if that all aligns with the pass of this star being a certain proximity. If those all seem to come along, if those all seem to coincide, it seems to cause catastrophes on the Earth that what we're talking about is, imagine something called like crustal displacement and tectonic shifts, like every single tectonic plate on the Earth goes off. Right. Now, you want to give the evidence for this. Most of the ancient megaliths around the world are aligned precisely to magnetic north and south. Yeah. The ancients loved to do that. They were masters. Of those ancient sites that we know of those structures that are a certain age, every single one of them, and I mean 100% of them, are off magnetic north by 23 and a half degrees everywhere on the earth. Wow. Meaning that the entire planet shifted the axis. Wow. So there's your explanation for how you imagine if you had all those things coming together 13,000 years ago and imagine the sun is bombarding the earth with cosmic rays and the magnetic poles shift and every single plate goes off in every volcano. And then you have tsunamis that are like two, three, how about five miles high driving around the world. Right. And that's why they talk about floods in ancient stories and all of these things. And that's where you tie in all of this stuff in these catastrophes is that the earth goes through these periods where it's like basically the end of the world it's like that movie the day after tomorrow yeah yeah where it's exactly where it, like, like it that. freezes and it's just everyone's yeah. just is just ice like if you 
Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, exactly. Remember, remember the mammoths? Remember the mammoths I told you that Edward Toll found that were frozen with undigested food in their stomachs and neck yeah. and their throats? That's because that, It's the because... same thing as the scene with the helicopters in that movie. Their fuel gauges freeze. Right. Everything just freezes. Like, it's yeah. the same thing. It's the same thing. That's pretty. That's it's pretty intense. wicked. That is wicked, man. Why? Well, so need... sorry. We have to add this layer, though, to understand the implications of this object are so severe that it was buried, like if an asteroid was coming that was going to be impending to hit Earth, and all knowledge of this binary companion was wiped from everything. And Robert Harrington and Thomas Green Flanner, the only two prominent drummers looking into it, they both mysteriously die within a short time of each other. They both die of throat cancer. Neither of them were smokers. The whole story is Miles Standish gets put in the head of the astronomy department, comes out, says that all mathematical calculations based on this planet that Pioneer found, based on the planet that Robert Harrington and Thomas Flanner were looking into, all mathematical and calculations, the whole thing buried. And Everything it, wiped. Then, then, only place that ever existed for Pioneer data, and I have searched and sourced, and that's why I'm writing a book on this, I'm somewhat of an expert, is that for some reason, the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia, page 2,480, was the only place that decided to include a diagram that gives us the entire truth, but says nothing about it in the description. It's nuts. That's crazy, man. And it says in it, for those who can't see it, in 1983, Pioneer 10 detected that this star was 50 billion miles from it. Is this the black sun? Yes. It's been called the dark star, the black sun. Is that why David Bowie called his album that? Who knows? But this is something that is woven into some parts of culture. and Big time. Especially and so, when you understand like, like the opposite of energy or whatever, right? It, like it's dark been called matter. the destroy it. Yeah, the destroyer or nemesis in some places. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. The destroyer of worlds. So, the Science wonder... Invention Encyclopedia is the only place that publishes it. And if you look at the image, this is what I need people to wrap their heads around. They're going to say, well, how do you know how significant this star is to all these cycles? How do you know? In that depiction, it says that Pioneer 10 leaves the Kuiper Belt, and yet it finds Pioneer 10 and 11, which, by the way, 11 goes a totally different direction. They both find equal pull gravitationally on every single object, including our sun, in our solar system from that object. It means that that object is equally affecting every single thing in our solar system, meaning it's dictating everything. So, wherever, so for where it goes, it's moving shit. So there's here. another, it's like... Um two opposing forces like magnetic it's, it's yeah magnetic like exactly aspect. they're it's spinning around each spin. other the positive and the negative imagine right we know that of all solar the systems yes isn't that funny the microcosm macrocosm it's almost like our solar system was designed like in this artificially weird way to represent that it's it's weird yeah but that's what the text state is like is that they move things around and like made it like that it's weird that's all i can tell you is that it's bizarre so but cool. i know Oh, and, and the thing is that it seems to play a significant role only as far back as like half a million years and it's like it wasn't there anymore. So this is a really weird speculation and I want to take another level. The depth is it. When did this thing explode? When did this cycle emerge? When did this happen like this? And that's what I'm writing the new book on. I was trying to figure out. I was like, well, have we been lied about the dinosaurs too? Is Did this thing explode 65 million years ago and kill them? Right. And then alter the whole planet for being really warm to then having cycles and then bring on mammals? Like the implications of this is vast yeah it is wow and being that you know we're, we're at a place where we're having less and less ice in antarctica less and less oh ice. we're at the definitely at the end of this cycle for sure you know when when the bottom of the apple starts looking sparse and then at the same time you know you see continents in the north on some ancient maps and and, that's and there's that's maps because they moved around well yeah and, and then there's maps with cities on Antarctica, ain't, you know, old, old maps. That's the thing is that there are land masses depicted in some old maps that is described like Plato and Diodorus that talk about Atlantis being destroyed and how it, it has a very, very detailed story coming out of Egypt and how elder priest named Sanchez, who was the head of this temple of Sais, talked about all these ancient catastrophes and land masses and civilizations that were destroyed and how there was a land mass that Atlantis existed on that was subducted and destroyed under the ocean and no longer exists. 
this. That's what we have to start thinking about with Earth history. Not what's called gradualism, but some extreme moments of things happening quite quickly. Right, yeah. It's not like it was like slowly, year after year, like water levels no. rose. Like it, like boom, like oh, in a day yeah. or something. That's what we have to wrap our heads around is that there were literally some land masses in some places in the world that are not there anymore, only from 12,000 years ago. Right. But they probably, it was probably engulfed and drowned, like, you know, submerged in That's day. what, plates, plates of duction. Imagine a plate diving under another one and then taking whatever's on the surface and sending it down underneath it. It's, yeah. I'm telling you, you would not, wow. if, if people want to look into That's what I'm intense. talking about, look into the sunken city that was found accidentally in the early 2000s off of western tip of Cuba. That's totally bizarre. The structures down there that have been identified by sonar are impossible to be natural and yet they're 2,000 feet underwater. Wow. We have to like scratch our heads about is this direct evidence of subduction of something that survived being subducted? That's crazy. Wow. Matt, you have given Man, so I'm much have to listen info. To this and take notes. <laughs> yeah. So much info and so much perspective. And, and you've also given us your time. Yeah, and we, we cannot it, thank you enough for that. I could see us definitely wanting to speak with you again in the future. If we need a part two. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. I enjoyed talking to you guys a lot. Man, same. Well, and I good. feel like we're only able to scratch the surface on a lot of this stuff and we all have you know limited time but I'd love to continue the conversation man you've got a really fascinating perspective and, and tons and, of uh, information and tons of information we appreciate yeah it, absolutely guys I'd love to do it again well good we will be in touch and like I said Matt Matt LaCroix we will post all of your info to where people can find you people can find your website people can find your books keep an open mind enlighten your mind right. and your perspective you know it just makes you a, a better person <laughs> and not follow the narrative, right. right? Yeah. Thank you again, man. Have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. See you later. Appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Later. Bye. How the Dang. fuck was that? Dang. That was serious. That was uh, next level, man. I mean, He's like a wise Buddha. He, he took it to the next level on many things. That was amazing. So, yes, um, thank you for listening again to the Man Fuse podcast. You know, we're just trying to bring in sources of information that help us try to understand well, dude, and I, make sense of the shit that yeah. Ben and I see, at least, the narrative and why we're here. Yeah, I feel what like the we fuck need are to, we doing? I feel like we got to unpack a little bit after that conversation. We can't just let it end here. Okay. I mean, there was just too many things that were brought up that are just so deep and so vast in those conversations. And I, I appreciated what he was saying about the cathedrals and the churches and the sacred geometry. Because I see it and I see these things and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, look at these things, and, you know? And the tuning. The tuning. Of the, the sound frequency. and the frequency. See, that's what I'm interested in. I, I, lo I love all that kind of stuff, man. You know, the dark star is a whole nother level of depth. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's threading a needle. But hey, you know, I love it. I love that he's doing the research. He's, he's putting the information out there. He's writing books. I mean, that takes some it, serious... Dark star, no dark star. I do believe and agree with these civilizations that have been wiped out, right. come back again and, and wiped out again. Right. I believe it's not happening on a gradual level. No. It's happening like... All of a sudden. All of a sudden, out of the fucking nowhere. Maybe maybe the ancient people had a better understanding right. than we do, and I believe that because of how in tune they were to right. the... To what do you call it? Space? You want to call it the gods? You want to call it the forces above us? Whatever it is, how they were building these these structures to mimic and align with the the poles and the I mean, crazy. That's right. And I do believe that they were more in tune with these cycles than we are, for sure. And you know, a lot of the things that he was talking about that occurred in Rome, like the the calendar. For example, <laughs> like the, the <laughs> calendar, like how we have 12 months instead of 13, like how it begins in January instead of April. The natural order of things, you know, the year really begins the new it's the new blooming of everything. You right. Know, everything blooms. It's spring, April. We've talked about it. But there's a lot of things like that that have shaped 
our lives and our culture and our beliefs beliefs and just everything around that it's important i think to reflect on that i mean because before that time before the roman empire there were civilizations that did understand these things and they created beautiful things yeah and and they knew a lot a lot more than we know but then again we have technology that we've built Mm. That uh, even as Matt was saying, that they yeah. don't have right. Absolutely, but I feel like the fundamental things, yeah, their ability to erect structures that we couldn't erect today is insane. Yeah. Tuned, you know, fine tuned with frequency, yeah, with m- such with, a beautiful with thing. Earth with space with stars and aligning it all. Can you imagine trying to align a structure to a fucking star? I yeah. mean, what kind of math skills do you need to be able to fucking compute that? It depends on a lot of things. And I mean, there listen, th- there are a lot of different theories out there. Of course. I mean, we were talking about this earlier that all of these things, even all the things that Matt was just talking about, theories, I mean, these are theories based on slivers of evidence that has been found that's right you know in caves or in from these ancient civilizations but but what is your curiosity do you have curiosity toward these types of things i do i do to me it's the most interesting curiosities and now we have the technology to share this kind of information on a scale that is is unlike any other time in history. So we're seeing a lot of the behind the veil stuff. Did you see where um, Elon Musk just sent the book of the world up in space? It's like some millions of pages. That's cool. So, and anything happens to Earth, yeah. this thing can be found. Somewhere out there. Yeah, and I forget, I don't have the info of where it went, but I remember them including this text, yeah. a thumb drive or something, whatever, right. that has all this stuff to where it can be downloaded. See, we have that ability where the ancients did not. Well, to, to Matt's point, you know, would something like that survive? If it was in space, if it we already right. sent it up, right? it's floating. But, somewhere or it's, but would it be meant to be read by you know someone else on earth with future generations i mean or is it something that is just going to go out into never endingness maybe into you where know? another species or life picks it up yeah is, what the hell was this shit pile right here yeah yeah and i thought it was interesting what he was saying i, I didn't even get into the the crystal skulls. I mean, I go 12 hours with that guy. You yeah. know what I mean? Because there's so many things that, again, you know, we have now the technology to share this information. I mean, the guy who he works with, Billy Carson. I mean, check out Billy Carson. This is a guy who has decoded all the ancient tablets. And it's very interesting information, these historic accounts. And they all involve some type of cataclysm of some sort solar the floods and many that we don't even know about right one of the things though that is interesting to me there are instances where you know structures that are unexplainable and we'll post some they they still have no explanation you know for a lot of the ruins and the things so yeah anyway hey if you want to weigh in on this compelling and rich episode with Matt LaCroix, Ben H., and myself. You can hit us up, of course, at manfuse.com or 770-744-5227. If you would, honor us by sharing the show. If you think somebody would be fascinated by this conversation, you know, leave us a review. Subscribe for free on all the major podcast platforms. We love you. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.